Hello and welcome to the program, Woke Up, where we amplify the voices of those that were seduced by the ideology of wokeism and critical social justice. And uh, if that was you or you know of somebody who uh, was uh, brainwashed into the, into the religion of wokeism, the secular religion that seems to be uh, taking over all of our institutions and doing so much harm in our culture and in families. And, but if you know these people or you're one of them, please contact the show. And we are going to, uh, uh, you know, we want to have guests that we can amplify their voices and their stories. And today we have a guest coming from Montreal, Quebec. Is that, how's that for a French accent? <laughs> Pretty horrible, <laughs> huh? <laughs> but anyway, this is Melody, Melody Curie, and she uh, resides in Montreal. And Melody, thank you and welcome to the show. And why don't you uh, start uh, by telling us your story, like, you know, what, what happened to you and what happened to you during your, during your time in, in school and as a young woman? All right. So, yeah, I was born and raised in uh, Montreal, Quebec, in Canada. Uh, I was born and raised there. I'm still there. Uh, it's, it's very common for you to stay in the hometown that you were born and raised in in Canada. I feel like it's not the same in the States. But um, and I have to start this interview off by making a disclaimer that uh, I can't even say everything I really would want to say, because unfortunately, uh, Canada does not have uh, First Amendment rights. And uh, recently, actually, you've probably heard that uh, the government just announced that they would start censoring podcasts, that they would now uh, need to approve of podcasts, or you'd have to get permission from the government to yeah, that's, that's news this week, and the European Union is starting to take some pretty uh, pretty oppressive controls as well, uh, eliminating free spe uh, speech throughout the, the European Union as well. And I thank God for at least the moment we in America have a, a constitution that's you know, holding strong in, in theoretically. Oh yeah. Like make sure you never take that for granted. It's insane. Like we are all kind of like, we didn't think it could ever get this far. Uh, but yeah, like it's, so yeah, I just have to start with that disclaimer. If I'm very vague in my explanations and answers is just because, uh, you know, I'm not as protected in my speech. Uh, you know, I could get maybe in trouble for what I say. So I had to start off with that disclaimer. But um, yeah, I'll try to be as detailed as I can. Um, I grew up uh, Orthodox Christian. Um, my mother was Orthodox. My dad was Roman Catholic. But my mother was more religious. And my grandmother, too, her mother was very religious. So it was just made more sense that I would be raised in their church. Um, but uh, my mother, the, the reason my mother is Orthodox is because uh, she's a descendant of, descendant of, uh, of uh, Lebanese and Syrian immigrants in the early 1900s. So it was quite a while ago, but uh, we still keep the culture alive. Like I grew up uh, eating Lebanese food and my church is very Lebanese. That's like half the mass is in Arabic. So I grew up with a lot of that culture and the influence of the Lebanese culture. And uh, I'm very very proud of that part of my heritage. So yeah, I uh, just thought I would say that, but. Um, well, you're so blessed in terms of the cuisine between yeah. uh, the French influence in Montreal and uh, the Lebanese uh, home style cooking that you get and uh, in the fellowships with the church. So sounds like you have a great diet. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But uh, I grew up in church a lot. Um, I, 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 I mean, I was bullied a lot in school, so I had a lot of insecurities and I felt like the church was like the safest spot that I could um, socialize. So I was very, very involved in church growing up, especially in my like teen years when, you know. How were you bullied? What did that look like more or less? Um, I, I, it's, it's weird. I think it's, I, I mean... There was nothing particularly odd about me. Maybe I just liked, I was very uh, my own person, I think. Like I didn't, I, I never liked follow, following with trends or following the crowd. I mean, maybe it's because uh, I liked anime, if you know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> That's considered, it was a bit weird. Like uh, maybe back then, you know, to be into anime, you were considered a bit weird. So people thought that was weird. Um I would say, I feel like that's the only thing I could think of, but just people were very, very mean. Like, like people would, uh, 
like basically, you know, you never, you would never think that you would, you would think that it's kind of like girls bullying other girls and boys bullying other boys. But I feel like it was the boys that would bully me the most. And they would literally physically push me. Like they were physically, you know, violent towards me. And they would, wow. they were so, I feel like just, you could tell that they were just badly brought up kids, like really badly raised. And like, they would just, it would, they would insult me all the time, just always being insulted and criticized. And I feel like the teachers in, in my uh, schools weren't supportive either. Like they, they didn't really have my back. They didn't defend me. I just feel like the whole, my whole experience in the education system, it was like very negative and very, you know, like it was just, I don't know exactly why it happened, but yeah, I had a very bad uh, school experience and I had, and it really drained my confidence for a long time. So that's why I was so drawn to church because, you know, church in my head is like, oh, no one could insult me there. You know, like no one could bully me there. Like, and if they do, they'll get in trouble, you know, because they're, they, their parents raised them well. That, that was my mindset. So I was very attached and very um, um, uh, attached to the church. I like, I really, most of my social life and in teenage, my teenage years was spent uh, socializing and at church youth groups. Okay, so then, uh, and then you had uh, some incidents that happened, uh, some traumatic things, and then you went in, into college. And do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, eventually, I think in my later teen years, I got disappointed with how my church youth leaders were were um, teaching us about things like, especially purity culture, like things about like we had like a whole like session on purity, virginity, and chastity. And I was still very pure at the time, but like, it's just, you know, you like when you're, you know, in your late teens, like, it's kind of like normal, like the conversations about sex start happening at school and everything. And I just didn't like the way that my church, it wasn't even the priests, I would say that like said anything that upset me, you know, it was more like the church, the youth leaders, especially the women, the female youth leaders at my church, I didn't like the way that they, they preached like, um, purity, because it just came off as very, very judgmental, and very um, self righteous. And it started that just started to bother me like it's I started to, you know, I guess want to rebel and I, I guess I, I was at that that age, where you didn't want to listen to rules, basically. <laughs> so that's kind of what made me start straying away more from the church. And that's when I got into college. And I just want to ask you a question on that, because you said that you weren't uh, actively acting out in an impure way yourself personally, but something in the church that you loved and that you were connected with, you didn't like the attitude. Uh, could that have been a little bit because maybe you had friends that maybe were not acting pure and you love them and you wanted to protect them and did that rub you the wrong way or am I just yeah, yeah. now that you mention it I think that that probably was it you know I, I I thought of you know all my friends I knew a lot of great friends good people that uh didn't necessarily abide by that and uh and and I just I just thought like it's you know it shouldn't be I feel like it's just that like the way they taught it is like you know it's if you make a mistake let's say or you do something wrong they made it sound as as if like now you'll never be pure again type thing or like mm -hmm. you know your 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 value goes down or something like that and it was it was stuff like that and just all the rules that like you know i it's just i started to you know you you it was that stage in um when you're you're you know about to reach adulthood and you start questioning and you start thinking like this is corny this is unrealistic and like I, I, I can't, I'm not going to follow a bunch of rules my entire life. I'm going to do what's best for me. And it basically, you start to self worship. I think that's what it is. You just think that your way is, is the right way. You know, you don't, and you don't want to abide by any authority. So I think that's what um, made me start drifting away from the church. And especially when you go in, when you, when I got into college, you see, all kinds of debauchery and, and degeneracy happened there. And you, 
you want to partake in it and you want to feel good doing it. You don't want to feel like guilty. You know, I feel like for a long time that when uh, I went to church, uh, church um, youth um, organizations, you, it would, it would leave constantly leave me feeling guilty. Every time I was doing something, I would ask myself, is this wrong? Is this sin? Is this sin? And I just, it just made me anxious. I just realized that it was making me anxious being too involved in the church and, uh, you know, listening to, to the youth advisors too much would just make me, it just gave me anxiety. And then finally, when I went to college, it was like, oh, I don't have anyone like breathing over my shoulder, telling me like, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is sin. So that's probably the, what the point where I realized like, uh, like I was, I was, I wanted to disassociate myself with uh, the church, but I never ever called myself an atheist. I was kind of too scared to fully, you know, accept atheism. I would think the closest I went to atheism was agnosticism, but I was always, I was, I was always calling myself a Christian. I still, I never wanted to let go of Christianity probably because my parents raised me like ingrained it in me like mm -hmm. so well so from childhood from toddlerhood you know my both my I lived with my grandmother my maternal grandmother actually and so I grew up listening to you know uh mass on the tv and like with the uh, icons all over the house so yeah like uh, I I feel like it always stayed with me and I feel like my baptism is what saved me from going down really far deep down the wrong path. But yeah, so the call the summer though, before I went to college, my father passed away. And that fueled my resentment mm. towards uh wasn't necessarily uh religion in general, but towards um I don't know, I was just angry, I guess. But um the combination of being bullied and being a bit resentful of what the church was teaching and my father's death, basically the combination of the three really fueled my passion for, for tolerance mm -hmm. and for, for acceptance. So I would say that I was very pro tolerance and Leftism very really attracted. I was really attracted to to. I was really drawn to leftism and uh, social justice uh, or critical social justice theory because I was so obsessed with tolerance and I was so forceful that everyone be tolerant, uh, that everyone should be accepting of every lifestyle of any walk of life. And you were obviously very, very high on the empathy level too, because, uh, and so there's a lot of allurement to that. There's a lot of attraction. So what, what, uh, how did you get exposed to it? And what, what kind of like sucked you into the ideology and the groups you were part of or the friend groups? So I think that uh, a big part of what fueled it was that in high school, terrorism was a very hot topic at the time. I forget why. It was probably because there was terrorist attacks happening. A lot of things, maybe the Charlie Hebdo thing happened. Uh, but I just, I you know, in, in Europe, there was, I think, a series of terrorist attacks and, and whatnot. And so Arabs started getting, you know, a bad name, a stereotype and whatever. And I think maybe even like the the, the Palestinian Israeli uh, conflict was happening too in some way. I mean, it always is at some point. But yeah, so people started talking about you know terrorism a lot, and like uh, Arabs started being seen in a bad light. And uh, I was very proud of my Arab heritage, and I didn't like uh, hearing people say negative things about Arabs. So, and not only was I like you know proud of my Arab heritage. Um, I, all my friends at church were Arab, you know, that's my community. So it wasn't even for me. It was the fact that my entire community that I associated with my whole life, they were like even more Arab than me. So I was very defensive of them. So that like really fueled me to defend them. And, you know, the idea of social justice 
like really like fueled me and made me want to defend people that I loved and protect and that I that I wanted to protect and then you know so I it just reminded me of the days when I was bullied just for being myself and like for liking the things I did that no one else liked you know I felt like I had to defend them too and I had to defend my culture yeah, it, it is kind of uh, interesting to me, and, and I don't really understand all the dynamics. I have some ideas, but in the critical social justice mindset or woke ideology, there is this uh, this anti-Israel uh, attitude and pro-Palestine, and uh, you know, there's this concept of whiteness. And I heard a, a speaker, uh, and it's not just about skin color, but whiteness is equated to capitalism. So whenever you hear a leftist talk about whiteness or that you can just uh, substitute the word for capitalism. And if you look at the, the concept of whiteness through that lens, that they're talking, they're Marxists talking about capitalism. And even there's some articles written and there's some concepts about Israel being hyper white. And we know that oftentimes uh, people of Jewish and actually Lebanese descent like yourself, but they're, they're great merchants. We were talking about that earlier uh, before we started the show. Uh, the Khoury family, which is your last name, the the success of the Khoury family that I'm aware of as well, other uh, Lebanese in the Dominican Republic. But uh, I, I've noticed that. And so I think there's something in, in this Marxist agenda that's definitely anti-Israel. And so you being of Arab descent, of uh, Syrian and Lebanese descent, that, that probably like resonated deeply within you. Oh, yeah, for sure. 100%. And uh, and my community at church, there's a lot of Palestinians, like obviously Christian, you know, Orthodox Christian Palestinians. There's a lot there. Then they there. There's a lot of them in my community, not just my church. But, you know, I went to conferences all over North America. There are tons of um, Orthodox Christian Palestinians. And, you know, they were they're very proud of their their background and their culture and their um, their fight, I guess. So that fueled me too, of course, you know, to, to stand with them. Oh, that's fascinating because uh, a, a novice from the outside would say that, well, they're mostly uh, um, of the Muslim faith and not necessarily of the Christian faith. And so I was, I was unaware of the, of the, the how big uh, orthodoxy is amongst the Palestinian community in the diaspora it's fascinating oh yeah yeah exactly in the di diaspora like 100 percent, maybe it's i'm sure it's different uh back home same for lebanon there's more muslim lebanese in lebanon than christians but outside of lebanon i'm i'm not exactly sure of the statistic but i'm almost sure that there's more lebanese christians in the diaspora than in lebanon itself and that's probably this like very similar situation for palestinians okay so you're in university and you're part of your community uh, you have a uh, high levels of empathy. You're obviously grieving the loss of your father and you're being seduced by the ideology of critical social justice. And why don't you talk a little bit about your mindset at that point and your attitude and, and like what was going on on a, on a psychological and emotional level with you? Yeah. So I feel like college really fueled the, the liberal in me, the leftist in me. Um, this was also when, um, so yeah, so I so I started in, I went to college in 2015, and this was r right before Trump's election or something. And this was also during the Trudeau election, I think something like that. Yeah. So I think politics were like a hot topic, like just naturally at, at that time. So people were very political, but to be honest, like I feel like I was even more political than the average person at that point because. Every part of me and my core was was just like anti-bullying and pro-tolerance and acceptance. Mm. And I wanted everyone to be political in the sense where they realized that I, I feel like I, I probably saw like the world as everything has a political message in every single topic, you know, <laughs> and I look back and it's so embarrassing. But uh, I was I, I can't help but say that like. I was so pro tolerance. I just, I was so angry at what had been done to me and like <laughs> the things that I had, that I had witnessed growing up, I guess, uh, towards Arabs, like, you know, and um, I was just so, I, my, my whole, like, my whole being, my whole like message 
I just wanted to be an advocate for bullying, for, to, for, for anti-bullying rather. So, you know, Trump is, you know, seen as a bully and Trudeau is seen as, you know, the, the one that preaches tolerance, diversity, acceptance. And that's exactly what I was like looking for my whole life. That's what I wanted. I wanted, that's what I wanted to hear in a leader, you know? So I was so, I was so, um, how do you call it? Like active uh, and ver- vocal. I was so vocal uh, when it came to politics. And to be honest, I, I don't, looking back and I still, to this day, I don't even understand how the federal politics work. <laughs> and so I, but I was just, I was just like, oh, you're preaching tolerance, you're preaching acceptance, you're preaching diversity. Like, please, like, win, please get elected. Like, you know, make everyone stop bullying people. Like, make everyone tolerant towards every religion and every race, you know? Because I was I was so against bullying. That's all I could think of. So you were probably deeply grieving the election of Trump and celebrating Trudeau. But as things have played out, it seems like Trudeau himself is very tolerant to those on his side and extremely intolerant to those that don't agree with him necessarily. Yes. Divergent views. That's exactly what I've come to learn. Okay. So, so then like what, what was happening then? Uh, So you're, you're looking at everything through the lens of social justice and politics and probably identity politics to, to a large extent. And, uh, you know, this value of tolerance and acceptance of everybody and everything and every point of view and every behavior. Uh, what were you observing amongst the, the leftist groups that you were involved with? So um, I befriended um, all kinds of people um, in university and they were completely different from the type of people that I associated with growing up. Like most of my friends growing up were ethnic in some way, of course, mostly Arab, because that was the community that I associated with the most. But I I would say like most of my friends that I befriended in uh, university, they were white, most, or at least half white or something. And they were, some were queer, some were, um, most of them were atheist, I would say or from another a religion or grew up in a religion other than Christianity. And so then I started to think like, you know, like this is amazing. All of my friends that are, that are so good to me, that are such great friends to me that I've met here, they're the opposite of what I grew up with. And that just shows that you don't have to be Christian to, or you don't have to be straight or you don't have to be a certain way, you know, that they tell us to be in church to be good people and to be good friends. And that, again, fueled my leftism. <laughs> that, that, again, it fueled, like, you know, or my, my I don't want to say anti-Christianity because I never fully dissociated with Christianity, but it fueled my, like, uh, my, my, um, my, I don't know how to say it. I, I want to say anti-Christian, but, you know, like, I was, I guess, like, I was, It's weird. I was still, um, I didn't want to disassociate with Christianity, but at the same time I wanted to escape it. Like I, and I guess at that point I was calling myself a progressive Christian, or I was also telling people I'm spiritual, not religious. I was so involved in um, this, my social life in college that I forgot all about uh, back home and what it was like. And um, all my friends, of course, they were leftist. And I started thinking like them. But uh, after a while, I started to realize that they weren't perfect. You were, probably, you were probably looking at your leftist friends as more tolerant, more loving, more accepting, more accepting, and the Christians uh, as less tolerant and hypocritical. And the ones on the left were probably, from your perspective, I'm assuming it sounds like we're exemplifying or manifesting the character qualities of Jesus more than those that profess to be followers of him. 100% you nailed it on the head <laughs> at the time like I was so impressed but uh with but you know with time like they didn't they they did things to disappoint me too you know and uh and then w- also with time I feel like maybe as they got more comfortable with me they started um you know insulting and 
acting intolerant towards my background and and the way I was raised and and towards Christianity. And even though I was a bit, you know, resentful towards Christianity at the time, I started to ask myself, wait a second. If if you're if you're supposed to, if you're tolerant, aren't you supposed to be tolerant towards every religion? Like including Christianity? And I think that's when I took a step back for the first time. Interesting. Okay. Well, yeah, keep going. This is fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, some of them started to mock some of the things that I would practice. Um, you know, I started going to the non-denominational church on campus and they thought it was weird. And, you know, I can't remember exactly the things I would do, but I just noticed that they would make little comments here and there that that showed that you know, they didn't have respect for my religion. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that Arabs are actually considered Caucasian. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. People people like to forget that. But, um, I mean, nowadays people want to, like, call Arabs brown. And I know some probably look more brown than others. But um, Arabs would be classified under Caucasian if they had to tick the box there, like in college admissions. Unless now I feel like now they make they give them a specific category for Arab American. But um, yeah, so there's that. And my parents and my mother have all, we've always considered ourselves as white, even though we're Arab, like we, we, especially back in the day, Arabs were always consider, considered white. But um, of course my family is just, is more fair skinned than probably the average Arab. But yes, I am white passing and that's how I was viewed. And um, probably was considered the oppressor, but people also made fun of me for embracing my Arab side so much because I looked white, I think. I don't think that they they said I was appropriating. I don't think they thought I was appropriating. Maybe they did, but they didn't say it. But they basically would mock me and say like, you're so white, you're a white girl. Why are you saying you're Lebanese? Why are you, why are you listening to Arabic music? Like, why are you, you know, like, why are you saying and telling everyone you're Lebanese when you're obviously white? It, you know, like, and they, and it, it's, a, it's as if like, they made me feel like it, maybe I, that I was appropriating. I don't know if that was the case, but it's like, no one ever had ever done that to me before. Like back, uh, back home, you know, my Lebanese friends, they never did that. You know, if anything, my Lebanese friends would, would be the ones to say, you're not Lebanese. Why are you acting Lebanese? Oh, that's fascinating. So were you, uh, what, what was your uh, mental health status at this point? Were you were you happy? Were you sad? Were you depressed or angry? Like what, what was going on in your day to day, your, your mood, so to speak? Um, I was angry. I would say I was, I started off as angry and then it slowly shifted to probably depression. Once I realized that my friends weren't the people I thought they were, they weren't the as tolerant as I thought they, they weren't the friends I thought I found that were full of tolerance and acceptance. And it's as if they themselves were mentally ill and they were projecting that on me, which, which in turn made me more depressed and, and made me kind of like they, I let them convince me that I was some, like something was wrong with me. So yeah, I would say that I was pretty, uh, I, with, I mean, you know, it was a weird transition. I think that I got to college um, excited, but also angry because of what had happened to me recently and in the past. And then it transitioned to sadness and depression because I felt more alone as the time went on and realized like my friends weren't as tolerant as I thought they were. And that the whole social justice mindset fueled my anger and I feel like the people I had met there were mentally ill themselves and they were projecting their mental illness on me, which in turn made me feel like I was, something was wrong with me. Yeah. So you're being gaslit in the same, and there's an expression, I don't know if you've heard of this one, the, uh, the iron law of woke projection never misses. So they, they project on people that which they themselves have or their problems, you know, intolerance or mental health or, or things like that. They, you know, racism. And it's, they're the ones that are acting like this, but they're the ones that are accusatory. Yeah, 100%. But uh, 
that's basically, I think, was the wake up call that um, made me realize that the, these people aren't as tolerant as they claim to be because. I don't feel except I feel that, you know, I, there were a lot of things they would say that didn't make me feel respected by them. You know, like some of them would mock my, my belief in God because they knew that I believed I wasn't very practicing as a Christian, but I was still, I was always, I think, spiritual. That's what I would say. Maybe I think the word was religious, but you know, I was too proud to say religious and I wanted to say spiritual, but they would mock my belief and my upbringing in God. And, you know, that confused me. It's like, aren't, aren't, aren't people supposed to be tolerant? And how come no one's saying anything, you know, when, when Christians are mocked? It seems that our Muslim friends or our Jewish friends are never mocked for their faith. And I think that, like, my, the, the, the attacks towards Christianity, even though I wasn't that religious, is what started to make me question what was going on. Yeah, it's absolutely, and I I do categorize wokeism as its own secular religion, and this is the most intolerant group, you know, around. They are, they want to control what you think, how you think, what you speak, what you say, what you do, and it's absolutely controlled. You're love bombed. You're encouraged to be in. Oh yes, peace. We love everybody. Love is love. Uh, we're going to accept everybody. We're tolerant of all people, but you better damn well conform or you're going to be uh, canceled or brutalized or shunned or corrected or go through a struggle session to force and, and to compel you to do exactly what they want. Yeah. So basically the more my, my friends at college started to disappoint me and the more I felt disrespected, I started to realize like they lacked morals, values, and integrity. And that's what I was raised to, to have. And I started to learn, like started to, you know, try to think like the correlation, what the correlation was between, I started to notice the correlation rather mm -hmm. between people that were raised, you know, with religion or maybe particularly Christian and those who weren't and those who conformed with the leftist ideology. And that's what kind of, started to make me question things you know and just all the the debauchery and the degeneracy that i witnessed at college you know like people having one night stands people doing hard drugs people getting blackout drunk it made me realize like maybe there's a reason why there's rules in place you know in religion and stuff like that you know like it kind of reminded me of, you know, Lord of the Flies when, you know, there's no authority there. Like, it's like the first time you witness a place where you're allowed to do whatever you want and there's no authority. And people people do what they want and they follow the religion of self-worship and they become their own gods. I started to witness that at college and it, and it just, it, I realized it really turned me off. Yeah, there... The the idea that we are created with a moral duty and responsibility, that there's accountability that God has made us and that we have the privilege to interact with uh, his creation with the, with the standard of morality is absolutely foreign to woke narcissism. It's you are God. You, you, you are becoming God. We, the collective are becoming God. We are making a better society and there's no thought of God. And I think it's just absolutely beautiful Melody, it's just so intriguing to me that even though you were extremely vulnerable, uh, you were seduced by something that seemed like it was so beautiful uh, that uh, the, the concept of tolerance and social justice, it's so attractive. It's so appealing, but there was something deep within you resonant, this fear of God, even though you saw the Christians as hypocritical, even though you were frustrated with a lot of things and you were experiencing new things. You were, you were protected that you, you didn't go all the way with it. Can you imagine these poor people that are, have no concept of God or the fear of God or that there's a God that loves them and that, that there is a Jesus that, that who's, who came to the earth? You, you always maintain that. As imperfect as your behavior was and your attitude was and full of resentment, you, uh, God protected you to, to not be totally taken over 
even though you dabbled in it, even though it was alluring, even though it's seductive. And uh, I'm just so, so thankful that, that, that your life was, was spared and uh, compared to like so many of your peers that their lives are an absolute mess. They're full of anger and bitterness and depression and ungodliness. And they they think that they're right, but they're causing so much destruction, not only to themselves, but those around them and, and, and a lot of people and institutions, you know, 100%. Um, and I feel like maybe it was my baptism, you know, the fact that I was baptized, baptized and, and raised, I really like, you know, it's not like my parents just cradled me, you know, and, uh, you know, said, this is what it is. And this is what you have to do. It's like, no, my, my mother and my grandmother were very, 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 very like pious. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, maybe pious isn't the right word, but they were very, they were strong believers. They were very serious about their beliefs. And I was, I, I grew up watching that my whole life. And I feel like I, it, it stayed with me and that protected me. Did you have any friends that uh, were not leftists that you were drawing off of as well? Or was it, were you pretty much just sucked into the peer group of uh, leftist radicals? So actually I have a family member, um, my second cousin, I'm very close to my second cousin and her father is my, my mother's first cousin. If you could uh, understand the relation, some yeah. <laughs> um, a co- I have a family member who's a cousin basically. Um, and he, he was very against it from the beginning. He saw it coming. He saw like all the signs of it happening and she was more neutral about it. I think she was on, you know, the, the other side of it. Like she was more, um, she was more conservative, but she was still more neutral. She wasn't very, like, she didn't really talk about it, but um, um, he's like an uncle to me. I call him my uncle. My uncle uh, told me, you know, he, he predicted everything. He's, he basically said, you know, just, just watch what, like what your friends will say once you have your opinion that goes against theirs, they're not going to be tolerant, you know, like, like he kind of, he basically warned me about, you know, the, the dangers of censorship and of, um, the anti-Christianity that was going on in the modern age, basically. And I didn't really believe him. Um, but I respected him. I always had a respect for him. Um, but him, he was the only person in my family that was on, on that, that was on, you know, not, uh, not into the social justice. And how much older is he than you, uh, just age wise? Oh, he's, he's like a bit older than my mom. My mom, she's like, he's like 40 years older than me. <laughs> so he, he had experience, obviously. Obviously, he had experience with leftists and leftism and the ideology, even though it's uh, morphed in this postmodern uh, transition. But he he obviously had a lot of experience because if he could predict and tell you exactly what was going to happen and exactly like he said was going to happen, did happen, and you observed it, and you, even though you didn't believe him at first, he obviously uh, was either studied it or had profoundly experienced it personally. 100%. And you know what, he was right. Uh, and I noticed it. Um, as soon as my opinion wasn't progressive enough for my friends, they would get offended and go against me, I noticed, like in certain instances, you know, or they would be quick to call me a name if if I if I made a joke, or if I, and, and that I wasn't doing on purpose at all, you know, like, or if I said something that was a bit, you know, unprogressive, let's say. And then that's, and I was, I was shocked, like I thought of him. And I was like, Oh my God, he was right. And so he told me about, this is where he tells me about a man named Milo Yiannopoulos. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> he, he, he's quite a character. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a bit embarrassed to like say that I really liked him, but at the time, like, I feel like that's what I needed to hear because a big reason why I was so against the uh, conservative mindset and the conservative, um, values or or whatever it was, is that I was constantly being told or shown that conservatives are old white men or old straight white men that have an old fashioned thinking and they don't, they don't give a crap about the youth and they don't care. They don't like women. Like I, I, they were very like specific based on what the media was showing. So 
I didn't want, that was the reason I didn't want to be ever be a part of that. It's like, why would you want to be considered part of that? You know, or that like, you know, you have to be a straight white middle-aged man to be anything other than like liberal or left. And then my family member, my uncle told me about Milo Yiannopoulos and how he's gay. Yes. And, he's, and young. <laughs> yeah. And he's young and he's funny and, and, and he, and he, he's into black men, all that stuff. <laughs> But he's also Christian. He's also Catholic, and, and and I remember thinking like, what? I need to I need to like look this guy up. There's no way. And he was right. And I just I guess that was an eye opener. That was a big eye opener. Like I appreciate it to to know that there it there were there are gay men. There are young gay men that are also conservative. It doesn't yeah. it's not just old white men. So that was actually um, impressive. To, to, to see that. And that's actually what made me more willing to listen. I think yeah, I've, I've actually been highly entertained and I, I know it's from, cause I've got a dark side to myself sometimes and some of my humor, but the, his banter with Jordan Peterson, you know, those, those they've kind of gone at it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I don't think I saw that, but I, I guess I was just, it, I was so impressed that someone of his personality and his like background could yes could be like that, that I, that's what actually made me listen. Like, I feel like that's what people like that are good for, you know, even though they're very, um, uh, not just offensive, even though they're very, uh, crude, I guess, or very, uh, and... yeah, that makes you want to like, listen to them. Cause that actually makes you interested and be like, Oh, how do you, how do you think like that? I like to know what goes inside your head and where do you, where, how do you come to that conclusion? Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, so so that was basically what opened me up to to that um, other way of thinking. I was holding a position on my student council um, in university, and the more I I learned about the other, you know, I, I was watching his lectures. I started obviously, you know, when you go down that hole where you so you learn about Ben Shapiro, and then you learn about uh, at the time Candace Owens wasn't big. Um, I remember listening a bit to Ben Shapiro and um, who else? Uh, I, I can't at the time. I don't remember at the very, maybe Stephen Crowder. I don't know. I just here and yeah. there, I started following. I started listening to different, uh, whatever they're called, their influencers or pundits. I don't know. Um, and I I didn't I didn't agree with everything they said. I was still very much uh, my into the pro-Palestinian cause. So I didn't I wasn't I didn't agree with everything they said, but you know, I, I realized you don't have to agree with everything someone says to to agree with some things they say and for them to be right on other things. Um, but just listening to different opinions and seeing that, you know, it's not just middle aged white men that have those kinds of opinions that made that kind of allowed it gave me permission, you know, to to kind of open my mind and think, oh, there's there's, you know, there's other perspectives like that. Then I started to see the pattern of people becoming offended just to be offended. And I started seeing it. And so I decided to make a blog post on WordPress or something on my Facebook and public and post it on my Facebook about, you know, uh, the different views that are my new views, basically. Mm -hmm. After reading, I read my my, my came out with a book at the time too, um, explaining like why he thinks the way he does, basically. And I saw his book on like how to deal with uh, the woke and, and when they're confronting you and a little bit sarcasm. I, I saw that it was a sh easy read. It was a short book. Is that the one you're referring to? Or is there a different one? It was called um, I don't know. I don't remember. Maybe, but it was called um, I don't know if I'm allowed saying this word. You can edit it out. But it was called. Um, danger the dangerous faggot or something that's what it was called oh, really? no. <laughs> um, that's what he named his his book because he calls himself a dangerous faggot <laughs> so and i just thought it was hilarious how he was like going around and being so crass and crude and like like uh, you know using using like slurs to like as a joke i don't know anyway i read that book and uh, i wrote a blog post basically reviewing the book and saying what i agreed with and how oh you know what he makes sense when he says this you know yeah. uh, he talks about like why he's against feminism and why you know he's this and that whatever so i made it uh, uh so yeah i made a blog post and it was it, i mean i'm a, 
like I, I was gonna show it to you, but I, I literally deleted, I think I can't find it. <laughs> I think I deleted it because I tried to forget about it because it was a bit of a awkward point in my life. I was trying to be funny in the blog post too. You know, I would I would use like the word bitch a lot, like I'm I'm not that kind of bitch, na 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 or whatever. <laughs> so I was so I was very I was trying to be witty, you know, like him. Yeah. But uh but I think people got offended by it. People were really offended. I, I mean, I don't want to specify uh what i said in it just so i don't get in trouble but i just to summarize i made i really made a point or i did my best at least at the time to try to to really watch my words and make sure i wasn't insulting or that i clarified that like i did not hate anyone and that i wasn't against anyone and that i don't hate anyone based on blah 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 you know like I, I feel like I even clarified it after every paragraph to really make a point <laughs> to reinforce that that like you know I have no hatred towards anyone and um and I then I got called uh into the student council for a meeting twice actually I think the first time like the president of the student council just wanted to just said like yeah I just wanted to uh you know touch base and and just like you know let you know you know be careful with what you say because you know people could say things and then then uh, whatever it was very it was very polite honestly i guess i mean she was just doing what she had to do then the second time i was sent um a whole like i was some, the, the they sent me basically a a uh, article about about tolerance or something oh boy <laughs> in the email and they said this time we're going to meet with our equity representative oh and i recorded the i asked them if i could record the meeting because i knew like I, I wanted protection basically and to look back on it whatever and they said yeah they didn't mind being recorded um and they basically the the equity representative and in, in summary and 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 to summarize it told me that people were not comfortable working with me because of what i had said and uh, it didn't make sense what I had said and that what I said wasn't true. I, I wrote a lot of things that weren't true. Um, maybe what I said wasn't true in it. I don't know. I, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it was, uh, I don't know, but in the end, like, it's like, okay, well, if it wasn't true, then why, then who cares what I said, you know, type thing. Like, I don't know. Anyway um they basically so yeah she basically said that uh, people were not comfortable working with me what i said didn't make sense what i said wasn't true and i eventually my camera died so i so it stopped recording and she said this after it stopped recording i don't know if she knew but she basically said that i have a, i'd have a bit of responsibility if anything would happen to like one of the marginalized groups oh please or something like i would i would have a bit of responsibility if something bad happened to like let's say a marginalized group like on campus or something like that so i said you know i could resign like if you don't feel if this is how you feel about me because and i think i tried to use their words against them i said you know i feel micro aggressed or something like that <laughs> and um and they said Oh no. And then, then all of a sudden they they were just like, Oh no, like, like, like this is nothing, this, this has nothing to do. We don't want you. Or like, they basically tried to fluff up, fluff up, fluff up their, their words or whatever. And, uh, anyway, I left and then I basically, I called my family member and he told me exactly what to do. And he said, if that's how they feel, why would you want to be there anymore? Because even if you do apologize, they're not even going to take your, they're not going to accept your apology. You know, you're, you're, you're never going to be accepted because the, no redemption. They, aren't, they aren't a forgiving population. They're not forgiving. So the way I, um, the way I, I, I resigned, I sent them an email saying, basically like he told me to play their game and he told me to, this is basically what I said is that, um, I would like to, I'm going to resign because it is clear that I am not wanted or I, or I said something like it is clear that I don't want to be somewhere where I am not wanted. I'm very, I'm very, I'm very sorry that people made, that people made misconceptions or people created misconceptions about me mm -hmm. and I don't want to stay where I'm obviously not wanted. 
and I wish everyone the best who's still there. Well, that was gracious. And did they respond to you or? Did they didn't you... respond. They just sent an email and they wrote my name too. Like they literally wrote my name, like my full name specifying Melody so-and-so has resigned from her position. So anyone who'd like to fill the position here, you can apply or whatever. So they, uh, that, that seems like that was pretty much a defining moment of you formally leaving leftism in, in, in a big way. 100%. And that, that was, I feel like that was a great social experience experiment mm. for me because that just showed how tolerant yes. the, the intolerant left is. <laughs> you know, you should write a book and call it woke fragility. I better be a bestseller. <laughs> that, yeah. I mean, uh, since then I've lost a lot of friends. Um, and I don't even know if it's exactly if it was specifically for that, like for, for my views, because some people kind of just like silently like left or silently um, disassociated themselves with me, if that makes sense. And it was a great social experiment, though, because it's like, wow, like if you're my friend and you know that I'm a good person, because I am, and you know I have good intentions, then you would see, like, even if you disagree with my views, you would keep me as a friend because you know I'm a good person and you see the good side of me. But, and then you, uh, and then you, you came back to the ancient faith, right? And how do they respond to you? So yeah, I mean, I think that experience basically really showed me that's what happens when you get involved in godless in a godless society in a sec secular society. Mm -hmm. And it made me want to come back and mm. embrace my roots again, because I looked back and I thought maybe they were right, you know, and I also grew up, you know, like I, I, I did grow up <laughs> and I kind of just, I feel like the watching the debauchery and the degeneracy and the intolerance of college in general, like of people in, in college and in university made me realize why it's important to go to church to to be involved in your community to stay mm. stay uh you know in your community stay stay uh, believing staying stay practicing uh follow the rules follow the commandments you know like and it's crazy because the bible predicted like everything that happened to me i like to i really like the quote where Jesus literally says, if, if people hate you, remember they hated me first. Yeah. Well, it's beautiful. And ultimately that it is a war on God. It's, it's, uh, and, and you representing a different value system, you're going to be hated for that. And you, you cannot mix the ideology, the godless ideology of wokeism with, uh, biblical Christianity or Judaism or Islam. You know, they're competing ideologies. And, you know, you and I both believe that Christianity is, is the truth and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, for those who, like you, have uh, still a fear of God and a, and a love for Jesus, uh, I think both your and my exhortation is a man cannot serve two masters or a woman cannot serve two masters. You cannot be a Christian and embrace a competing godless ideology uh, that's all-encompassing, that demands everything from you and controls you and still uh, have a flourishing and abundant uh, spiritual life as a Christian. It's a, the, the, the two are impossible. So you, you have to uh, make a decision here. And uh, you know, obviously our encouragement would be that you in, uh, embrace Jesus and his truth. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it was. I mean, I grew up, I kind of, you, when you grow up, it's like you realize, like, you can't just be your own God and do what you want. You There's a reason that we are yeah. given a book of rules and a set of commandments and, a, and you know, to abide by and to follow. And, you know, obviously you're going to make mistakes, but the point is, is that you know it's wrong. You know, I used to try to justify my sins all the time. I used to try to justify the bad things I was doing because I, you know, pride, you know, gets the best of you. But now I learned, you know, don't justify your sins. Like, just admit that, you know, you screwed up, 
and try to do better. You know, that's, that's, that's what matters at the end of the day. And I feel, you know, even though I lost all those friends, I re I, I look back, I'm like, I lost nothing. I have an amazing mm -hmm. friends now. Like I look back, they were so, they were such bad friends and they were, and they were, I was surrounded by, you know, people that I, I got involved with the wrong crowd, basically, you know, that's, that's all it is. And, uh, now like I have a, I have a great partner. I have, I have great friends. I mean, not all my friends think exactly like me, of course, but I don't care. That's not the point, you know, exactly. Like, they, they respect how I think though. And they see my side, like, you know, if you, if you're, if you're able to have an open mind and have an intelligent viewpoint in conversation, even my friends that don't agree with me, they hear my side and they're like, yeah, I, I see what you mean. You know, like they, they understand where I'm coming from. You know, that's what matters is that we just respect each other's opinion. And, you know, we're not going to disown each other as friends or as family members uh, if we don't agree on the same thing, you know? So that's basically what brought me back to the church and Christianity. And you know what? I went back to church and the people that I thought probably thought I was a long gone lost cause, they <laughs> embraced me back. They embraced me. They, they forgave me. They, you know, and I don't, and I, and some of those people I'm friends with again, you know, the ones that I disagree with, you disagreed with um, that the way they taught us at, uh, at church functions, I'm, I'm their friend, you know, and like, I think I look back at it and what I learned in the end, the lesson I got out of college and out of everything and after going back to church is that there are hypocrites everywhere in, in every re religion and every, in every um, belief system. But what I noticed with Christianity is that if they're practicing, they're usually aware of it. They have self-awareness of it and they're very forgiving whereas the other side is not. Absolutely. And if you look at the ideology of wokeism, once you make a mistake, you are humiliated. You are uh, told that you're, you're not accepted. Your son sometimes absolutely canceled. You're, you're sucked into this and it's a com complete cult. If you do not conform, you're done. And there is no forgiveness as you were uh, saying earlier versus Christianity. And isn't it wonderful how, in Christianity, I'm not talking about Christians themselves, because as you're saying, yeah, there are hypocrites, but there are a lot of wonderful, wonderful, beautiful Christian people. When you make a mistake, you're not shunned. You're not cut off from God. God, You make a mistake, you repent, you come back, and you're restored. There's redemption. There's hope. There's a newness of thinking and, and acceptance versus the diabolical and demonic force of a uh, the woke ideology, which is completely opposite of the Christian message. And, and it sounds like you've encountered a, a wonderful community. So I, I'd like to give you the last word. And what I'd like you to do, if you could, is anything on, on your heart that you want to share, uh, please do. But I'd also like you to give a, a word of exhortation or encouragement to somebody who's uh, really being seduced right now or seeing the enticement of the critical social justice ideology, uh, what to watch for and maybe an exhortation to avoid it or those that are stuck in it and brainwashed and are going through depression and frustration and wanting uh, to fight against the inequities, you know, how they can possibly look at the world from a nuanced perspective and, and get out of this uh, bondage ultimately and maybe give families hope uh, for those that have lost uh, loved ones to the ideology. So I'd like you to just like speak to those that might be listening that have been affected or about to be affected by this yeah so i would say have an open mind please like have an open mind don't reject someone as soon as you disagree with them you know try to see their point of view um people, oh, try to be try to be tolerant you're saying <laughs> oh yeah yeah 100 percent. i mean but i guess people don't know what tolerance is like true tolerance nowadays or it should be too true tolerance should be that, you know, you are open to listening to different perspectives and don't label someone as hateful just because you disagree with them. Because I think that deep down at the end of the day, everyone wants what's best for the world. They just have different ways and ideas of going about it if the intentions are pure. And um, yeah, like just to try actually to practice true tolerance just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean they hate you. Just because someone doesn't have the same idea 
of um, acceptance or just because someone doesn't have the same idea as um, as uh, as you in general doesn't make them hateful. It doesn't mean that they're trying to stop you and and prevent you from having any freedoms. It's not it's not it's not what the news and the media tells you. It's don't listen to the media too much. You know, try think for yourself. Think for yourself. Try not to just listen to someone just because you think that they're right. Really, like, you know, do your own research um, and just try to have respect for everyone. Not everyone is out to get you. And the world also isn't black and white. There's no, there's not usually a black and white answer to everything. There's a lot of um, context uh, that you have to consider. And um, yeah. Well, Melody, I really thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your heart and your story. And uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and may God bless you and prosper you. And uh, we're going to put your email in the show notes. And if uh, anybody wants to reach out and maybe uh, ask you some for advice or some encouragement, uh, but I uh, really appreciate the, the, your time and uh, may God continue to bless you and your, and prosper you in your, in your journey and uh, knowing him and your future endeavors. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honor and uh, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Okay. You take care. Thank you.